If you have your Bible again, 1 Peter, if you need a Bible, there should be Bibles on the back table, and um, if you need to get attention of one of our ushers, they can get you them, unless, I don't know, it looks like most of them are gone back there, um, but we stopped putting them, I told you, in the pews just because they were leaving little red scuff marks on the back, and uh, the meeting house was asking me what those were from, I had no idea, and then we figured out it was from the Bible, so they're on the back table now when you come in if you need them, and uh, you can grab them. 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we just looked at verses 1 through 5. And uh, just go from, uh, by way of introduction through the book and, and to kind of lay a foundation as we begin to understand and look at these uh, verses and this epistle. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. The author of the letter is obviously, as you could figure out, Peter. Peter, when you read the New Testament, is probably the second most prominent man in the Gospels after Jesus Christ. This is the same Peter who walked on water and then sank in the water. This is the same Peter who confessed that Jesus was God and then was rebuked by Jesus a moment later. This was the same Peter who protested that he would never deny Christ and then a few minutes later he denied Christ three times. This is the same Peter who was later after his denial restored at the Sea of Galilee by Jesus Christ. So this is the same Peter who is writing and penning the words we find in this epistle. He writes, you notice in verse 1, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I was was studying and listening to some uh, podcasts and reading some uh, commentaries on this and It's interesting that when you read the books in the New Testament, most of them are written by the Apostle Paul. And a lot of times when Paul begins out his letters, he'll say, Paul, an apostle of God, by the will of God. Or he'll say something to to that nature, by the will of God. But Peter doesn't say anything to the sense. In fact, he just says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, period. And I think that's interesting because Saul, who later became Paul, was an apostle who became, he became an apostle later after the ascension of Christ. We know the story of the road of Damascus, but Peter was an apostle of Christ from the very beginning, called by Christ himself. And to put it simply, no one questioned whether or not Peter was an apostle. He simply said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and everyone knew The Christians knew exactly who he was. Now, the timing of this epistle, I think, is interesting as well. Most commentators believe that it was written 30 years or so after the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. So that would put us around A.D. 60 or 65. Somewhere in that window, he writes and pens these words. 30 years after Christ has ascended to heaven. And in verse 1, right out of the gate, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he lets us know who he's writing this letter to. Look at verse 1 again. To the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. First Peter is a letter from Peter to the other Christians or believers who had been dispersed through the ancient world. And in the time of this writing, they were under intense persecution. They were under a lot of suffering. And we'll look at, as we go throughout the book, a common theme throughout 1 Peter is hope in suffering. A lively hope through Jesus Christ. And he's writing to these Christians, they're they're scattered abroad in those towns and those cities that were just listed, would be modern-day Turkey, as we would look at a map today, is where most of those cities and towns that he's writing to were located. It's interesting that right back in those times when Christianity and Christ came to the earth and and the disciples went throughout uh, preaching the gospel, that Turkey was was really a a, a hub for Christianity. And now you look years later, it's very hard if there's any kind of Christian church in the modern day country of Turkey. But that's exactly where Peter is writing and penning these words to. I think it's also interesting that when you read a lot of the epistles in the New Testament, we went over this in discipleship, but you would call 1 Peter a general epistle. 
Why? Because it's not written to a specific church. If Paul was penning, okay, the book of Ephesians, he was writing to the church at Ephesus, or First and Second Corinthians, the church at Corinth. And so something happened in the church, Paul got wind of something, and so he would write them a letter. And God used and inspired that letter and preserved it for us today in the canon of Scripture. But we would call those, you know, so those were epistles to certain churches and specific groups of people, while First Peter would be a general epistle because it's not written to a specific church. It's written to different groups of Christians that are scattered throughout modern day Turkey and are facing severe suffering. Look at verse one. What does he say? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, we list the towns, but notice what he says there before he lists the location. He says to the strangers, he calls them strangers. Or another word that we might use today in our vocabulary would be foreigners or pilgrims. Why? Another common theme throughout Peter that he hits right away here in verse 1. Peter's reminding us that as believers and to those Christians who were suffering on this earth, he's reminding them, he's reminding us today, thousands of years later, that this world is not our home. This world is not our eternal destination. Thanksgiving is coming up soon, and so we hear the word pilgrims, you know, uh, a lot as we get close to Thanksgiving, and we think of strangers or foreigners or pilgrims, what, they don't settle down at one place. They, they journey until they find a location where they could rest and they can be established. And Peter is reminding us as Christians right away in verse 1 that we are strangers, that we are foreigners to this world. This world is not our home to settle down into. Our place to settle down into one day, praise the Lord, is heaven. And I don't think as Christians we really grasp and understand how magnificent heaven is really going to be. And I think a lot of times in modern Christianity in our churches, we have Christians that are so in love with this present world that we live in. Now that doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to be successful and, and have fun and enjoy His creation and enjoy your family and the gifts that He's given you. Not at all. But as Christians, so oftentimes we have a temporal view of things and we need to have an eternal view. We are here and we're more worried about what we're investing in our 401k, all that's a responsible thing to do, than what we're investing in eternity. What's going to matter one day when you face Jesus Christ that at the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be the financial and moves that you made here on earth. It's going to be what you invested for all of eternity. And Peter is reminding us right out of the gate, Christian, this world is not our home. As the old hymn says, we're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up one day beyond the blue. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our destination. And praise the Lord, because heaven is our home, and we'll get to in a moment, we have a hope. We have a hope. And that's why one of the major themes is a lively or a heavenly hope. Peter is pointing us and reminding us that heaven is our final destination. Look at verse 2. Now, verse 2, and we won't spend too much time here, but this is where you're a new believer. You've been saved for years. There can be some controversy and different, uh, controversy and different opinions on things. Nonetheless, I've studied and prayed and asked the Lord for wisdom as we go through this, and we could probably spend an entire message talking about verse 2 in different passages of Scripture. We're just going to touch it briefly, and I believe I will share with you what the Lord showed me. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Very simply put, what Peter is doing here in verse 2 is he's describing a Christian's birth. He's describing what it means, you might have heard the term, to be born again. And he's, he's, he's letting us know the process in just a few words as he writes, these, writes this letter. He's letting us know the process, what takes place, what goes into you and I having salvation. We first see right there in verse 2, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. 
It's important to understand that the miracle of salvation, if you've put your trust in Christ and your faith in Jesus Christ, the miracle of salvation began, it all began with God. We were chosen by the Father, but this election was not based on anything we had done because we were not even on the scene, nor was it based on anything God saw that we would be or do. And these are two common belief systems, and I'm not trying to confuse you, but we got to work our way through this, of what people believe. God's election was based wholly on his grace and love. And God's grace and love we simply cannot explain. Look at Romans 11. You don't have to turn there, but Romans 11, 33 through 36 reminds us of that. So when I see that phrase, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, I say, Pastor Zach, what does that mean? In my opinion, and I encourage you to study this for yourself, it means that God... Before the foundation of the world, he elected or he chose or he determined to provide a plan of redemption for man, knowing that we would fall, knowing that we would fail, knowing that we would sin. He provided a plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ, and Ephesians 1.4 tells us that the choosing of that redemption plan is based off those who are in Christ, of those who choose Christ for themselves. The choice is ours. And that's why I believe God so loved the world, that he, the, the world, right? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever, not just a group of people, but whosoever can call on Jesus Christ. Anyone can be saved. Anyone's life can be turned. God didn't just die for this group of people, but not this group of people. Not in my opinion. I've been studying in scripture since I was a teenager, and I, and I just can't, can't hang on that concept. I just read time and time again that God loved the whole world. He died for everyone. But in his sovereignty and in his providence, and sometimes our finite minds can't really wrap our minds ar ar around it, we can't wrap our head around his sovereignty and his purpose, but God knew before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us we would fall. And so he set up a plan of redemption for all of us. But that plan of redemption is our choice if we're going to choose Christ for ourselves. So we see that when we trust Christ, when we get saved, it all starts with God. But second, you see there, through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification of the Spirit. And thirdly, we see obedience and sprinkling of the blood, Jesus Christ. You see, when we trust Christ, the Holy Spirit of God convicts us of our sin and need of a Savior. Let me try to put this real bottom shelf here. I know we feel like we're in a seminary class right now, all right? But we're getting through, so stick with me. Verse by verse, this is where, this is where we end up, all right? But just stick with me. We're going somewhere. I'm going to put this bottom shelf for us. Ready? As far as God the Father is concerned... I was saved when he chose me before the foundation of the world. Now remember, God chose all of us. It's his will that none should perish, the Bible says. And he puts the responsibility of faith on all of us. As far as Jesus Christ is concerned, I was saved when he died for me on the cross. That plan is now in action. But as far as the Spirit of God is concerned, I was saved April 13th, 2007 as a 15-year-old boy when I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and trusted him. That's when all of it came together. But it took all three persons of the Godhead to bring me to salvation. We looked at discipleship this last week, the Trinity. It took all three persons of the Trinity to bring me to salvation. God, who redemption's plan before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, and the Holy Spirit of God, as I sat there and I heard the gospel that pierced my heart and convicted me and said, I need something I don't have, and allowed me to put my faith and trust in Christ. Now, here's the important part, and we'll move on. If we separate these ministries will either deny divine sovereignty or human responsibility. And that would lead to heresy. It's, you can't just pick and choose. We must understand it took all three persons of the Trinity and it took us to put our faith in what God did. We had to take that step. You had to take that step. If you haven't taken that step in your life, I would encourage you to do so today. The same God who ordains the end, our salvation, also ordains the means to the end. The preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. Now we can spend a lot of time in verse 2 there, but I hope that just gives you a snapshot and some understanding. And again, more than willing to talk and explain, but I, I truly believe that's what the Bible is teaching us. Let's look at verse 3. Peter continues, he says, Blessed be the God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. I love that. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we see in verse 4 a Christian's birth being described, what goes into salvation. But Peter continues to describe how our new birth, now that we're saved and we're a Christian, how it leads to our hope. It leads to a believer's hope. This morning we, praise the Lord, have a living hope. A living hope is one that has life in it and therefore can give life to us. Jesus Christ died and rose again, and because of that, he offers life. He offers eternal life to us, and as Christians this morning, our hope is heaven. And I've been through, I, I, I've done funeral services and memorial services. I've lost loved ones and people and friends and people that I've lost that I knew were believers. And it is, yes, there's the grieving process, and that's, that's normal, and yes, you go through that. But yet, as a Christian, I step back almost with a smile because I have a hope that I know that that person is in heaven. I know where they are. Death will come one day for me. My coffin could be in town this week. I have no idea, but I do know that I have a hope and a peace because I know where I'm going to end up one day. I don't worry. I don't stress. I don't wonder when it's going to happen and, and, and worry about it. And I trust the Lord and know whenever my time will come, it will come, but I have a hope and a security in my life because I know where I'm going to be someday. And man, how sweet heaven's going to be to go through those pearly gates, to go on those streets of gold and to go and see the grandparents and the friends and the, and the uncles and the relatives that have gone before me and above all that to see the saints of old in the Bible and then for all of eternity to finally see God face to face and to fall on my knees and it's not going to matter what I did on this earth. It's not going to matter how successful I was. It's, it's not going to matter what kind of car I drove or, or what house I had. All that's going to matter is God the Father as I'm on my knees worshiping Him for all of eternity. What a magnificent place heaven is. And what a hope that it gives us as Christians. Our hope is heaven People get nervous. People get worried about our society and our politics and our country and our world. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be active in those things. I, I believe you should. And it's your responsibility to vote and do all those things. But if we're not careful, we get so caught up in, in, in the tribulations and, and the news cycles and the conspiracies and, and all these things. And it creates anxiety and worry and depression because we see how south our world is going. And yes, I don't want that to happen. And yes, I pray for our country. And I pray for our world. And I pray for our churches and Christians in our town. But at the end of the day, World War III can break out tomorrow. But I still have hope because I know what awaits me after this life. I have hope because my foundation is on and in Jesus Christ. Now time, as you go throughout this world, it destroys most hopes. They fade and they die. But the passing of time only makes a Christian's hope that much more glorious. Getting closer to heaven, getting closer to the return of Christ, where he'll come and he'll call his bride home, and we'll be in heaven together for all of eternity. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance, I love this, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you in verse 3 peter revealed that we are born again and that because of that we have a living hope but now he continues explaining that we are also born again to an inheritance how can we have an inheritance because in christ we have become heirs of god's endless fortunes how can we possibly be heirs of god because in christ we have become god's own Children. Incredible. You look at this world today and maybe some of you have received an inheritance before. You received a uh, sum of money. You received a home. You received some kind of inheritance and it comes and it goes. And Peter is telling us not exactly what this inheritance is, but he's telling us what it is not that we receive from God. And by the way, before we go to what it is not, understand this morning that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. God is your father and he loves you and he sees you and he knows you. And I love that song as she's downstairs in nursery that Kath just sang, run to the father, fall into grace, fall into his arms. He's there. He's a heavenly father who loves you this morning. 
Don't take for granted your salvation. Don't take for granted that you're a believer. Yeah, I know. He died on the cross. I prayed. I asked him in my heart. I'm going to heaven someday. Okay, great. Now I'm just going to move throughout life. No. Understand the depth. Understand how powerful salvation is. That yes, we have a home in heaven. Yes, we have a hope in heaven. But also we have an inheritance from God. Why? Because we're his children. And look at this inheritance. Not necessarily what it is, but he tells us what it's not. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it fadeth not away, reserved in heaven. The Christians Peter was writing to were experiencing heavy persecution for their faith in Christ. And we'll look at that as we go throughout the weeks. They were suffering. One of the ways we suffer in our world is that we have very little value sometimes in this world. What do we have, what we earn, or what our parents and grandparents may have left us can easily be lost or taken away. But as children of God, our inheritance can never be lost. And I don't know about you, but that causes me to say amen and have some hope in my life and have some peace in my life because I can't lose. No man, the Bible says, can pluck me out of my father's hand. He's my father. I'm his child. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. And it fadeth not away. It's ours now and forever. It can't die. It's undefiled. It can't become corrupted. It can't break. And it can never lose its value. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That word kept right there in verse 5. In the Greek, follow me, it means to keep as in a garrison or a fortress. Or as with a military watch. The idea here that Peter, as he pens these words, is that there was a faithful guardianship exercised over them to save them from danger. As a castle is watched to guard it against the approach of an enemy. So the meaning is this, in, in, in the Greek, when you really break down that word, the meaning is that Christians were weak in themselves. Right? We're surrounded by temptation. And the only reason why they were preserved was that God exerted his power to keep them. The only reason which any Christians have to suppose they will ever reach heaven is the fact that God keeps them by his own power. Praise the Lord. We're kept by the power of God. But how are we kept by the power of God? Notice what he says. Through what? Through faith. The person who is kept by God is, yes, the person who has trusted Christ as his Savior, but also the person who is abiding in a continual relationship with God. As long as we have faith in God and in his promises, we are safe. Think about that. In an unstable world where things are always changing and people are always going back on their word, if we continue that faith in God, first we make that first step to put our faith in him, but then we trust him day in and day out and we walk with him day in and day out, we are safe. We can settle on his promises. He will keep us. He will lead us. He will guide us. This is all part of salvation. This is all part of what it means to be a believer, to be a Christian. It's magnificent. It's wonderful. It's more than just a ticket to heaven. Through faith, looking to Christ, leaning on him and living upon him. By faith, getting the victory over the world and over our enemy. This is why, as a church, this is why, as myself and my family, we've sold our lives out to tell everyone we can about the magnificence of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it transforms you and it keeps you and it helps you and it changes you and it, it, it redirects your eternal destination. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. And man, so much to unpack just in those five verses. And what I'm going to try to do real quick and we'll be done is give you three, three truths that I jotted down as I read these five verses that I believe God is teaching all of us. Number one, I jotted down after reading verse 2, I wrote this, the immaculate gift, meaning what? And I've already touched on this. Salvation is the greatest miracle and the greatest gift in the world. It is the gift of eternal life, freely given to all who want to receive it. It lasts for eternity and it never stops giving. It's a gift that we did not obtain through our good works, but through God's grace. Salvation changes me from a vagabond to a child of God with an incorruptible inheritance. From an emptiness inside my heart and soul to a filling of the Holy Spirit of God. To an eternal destination of hell and darkness and pain and demons and torment. To an eternal home in heaven in the presence of God the Father, my loved ones and the saints of old. 
A life of unrest to rest. A life of anxiety to peace. A life of hopelessness to purpose. A life of loneliness to a relationship with Jesus Christ. A life as a prisoner and an addict in sin to a life of a victor. The victory. A couple weeks ago, I think it was like two weeks ago at this time, we had a young couple, they're not here today, Wes and Tori, and they might be watching the live stream, and Wes invited his co-worker to come to church. His co-worker came to church, and he came with his girlfriend, they live a town or two over, and they came for the first time two weeks ago, and we were given the invitation like we do here every Sunday, and the man there, the gentleman, raised his hand for salvation, and so... I asked Brother Brandon to go back and, and to talk to him and to explain the gospel and to give it to him. And he went back in that, right there in that little foyer area and Brandon opened the Bible and began to give him the gospel and, and witness to him and tell him what Christ did. And this young man said to, in his early mid-twenties, looked at Brandon and he said, you know, I've been looking for something. He said, I've been searching for something. He said, I, 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 brought, I, I've been, I brought a Bible and I've been reading it. I went to the Catholic Church in my town a few times, and I'm looking for something. I've been, I've been searching for something. And he looked at Brandon, and he said these words, but today I found what I was looking for. And his life's forever changed. They came back last week, shook my hand on the way out, said, we'll be back. I'm going away for two weeks, but we'll be back. And we love it, and God's working in his life. And that's what salvation does. It changes you. It's the greatest gift. It's the greatest miracle in all the world. And people may not realize it, but it's what they're searching for. It's what they're missing. It's that void in their heart is the salvation of Jesus Christ. The greatest gift of all that Peter breaks down to us in these short verses is salvation. And with that truth, it reminds me of this. Number one, make sure you're saved. Make sure you're a believer. Make sure you're born again. Make sure you know Jesus Christ is in your heart. And if you do, go tell everybody. Tell everyone the good news, the greatest miracle in all the world. Also, I wrote number two. The inexplainable or inexplicable identity. Notice this in verse four and five. Peter tells us how we received an inheritance. And so I've jotted this truth down. Because we have received an incorruptible inheritance from God, we ought to reflect his identity. Because we've received an inheritance from God, we ought to reflect his identity. Identity is defined as the collective aspect of the set of characteristics by which a thing is recognizable or known. So our new identity in Christ should be recognizable both to ourselves and to others. If we are in Christ, that should be evident. Just as I can look at people who are not in church and have a conversation with someone, and I can quickly tell you, okay, they're not a believer. Just, you know, every other word is, 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 another, is taking the Lord's name in vain. Or you can easily tell they're not a church-going person, they're not a believer. Not judging anybody, but you can tell. And just as easily... When a stranger sees you, believer, I don't care how long you've been saved, they ought to see something different. Because we've received an incorruptible inheritance, as Christians, we ought to reflect the identity of our Father. We ought to be ashamed of it. We ought not to hide it. We ought to be embarrassed about it. We ought to reflect that we are indeed a believer. Does my day-to-day -day lifestyle reflect Jesus Christ? A child of God is different. Turn, if you would, real quick to Galatians. Real quick, keep your finger in 1 Peter, because we're not just done there yet. But I want, to, I want to show you Galatians chapter 5. This is another verse that we looked at in discipleship this last week. But I love this. If you ever want to do a good study in the Bible, study all the lists in the Bible. Anytime God gives you a list, study those lists. Here's one of those lists, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. Talking about reflecting God. Talked about we received an inheritance. We ought to reflect in an identity. I study that and I read that. And in Galatians, Paul gives us this list that we call the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you not to evaluate the person next to you, in front of you, behind you. I want you to evaluate your own heart and mind, Christian. Does this reflect your life? Because if you're saved and, a, G and a, a saved believer of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. These are the things that should be outpouring in our lives. For the fruit of the Spirit is what? Verse 22. I'm sorry. Verse, did I say that? Chapter 5, verse uh, 22. 
Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Not bitterness, not anger, not gossip, not malice, not a liar, not a thief, not immorality, not being unpure, not following the things of this world, not, not being pressured into, into our culture and our society, but no, 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 love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And you can turn back to 1 Peter, but the thought is this. If we are truly a believer of Jesus Christ, then we ought to act like it. We ought to act like a believer. We ought to act like our Heavenly Father. The more I spend time with God, the more I get to know Him. And the more I get to know Him, the more He works in my life and I understand His attributes and His characteristics. And I want to portray that. You know, the, longer, the, the more as Luke gets older and he picks up on every little thing that you say. He had a, one of our gospel uh, church tracks in the back yesterday. And he's in the car seat, and we're getting him out of the car seat, and he says, look, Mom, it's my debit card. I said, how does he know what a debit card is? No idea. He's listening to everything we say. I said, hey, pass me the debit card. Every little thing, the more he spends time with us, the more he picks up on what we're saying and who we are and our characteristics. And the same goes true for Christians. The more we spend time with God, we understand who he is, and we should take those things and apply them to our lives and be a difference maker for Christ. Number three, and we're all done, First Peter. The immaculate gift, the inexplicable, inexplicable identity. And then I jotted this down to conclude these five verses. The immediate hope. The immediate hope. Because of Jesus Christ, sir, ma'am, we can have true heavenly hope in our lives. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we have a lively hope. Biblical hope is simply this, a confident expectation or assurance based upon a sure foundation. Who is our foundation? Jesus Christ. A dead God or, or a Buddha can offer a dead hope, but a living God, a living Christ can offer a living hope. And because Christ lives, and because he lives within my heart, and because he's still working in our world and lives today, I have an assurance and a hope. I say, well, pastor, I have no hope. My life is hopeless. Then I would tell you this, number one, trust Christ and find hope that will change your life. You say, well, I've trusted Christ before. Then I would say, get your eyes off self and circumstances and back on the living hope of Jesus Christ. Biblical hope is a sure foundation upon which we base our lives, believing that God always keeps his promises. Hope in God and a confident expectation in God, knowing that he keeps his promises I jot it down as I was reading this, some of God's promises that bring me hope in my life and, and steer and direct my life. God promised that he would comfort us in our trials, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. He has a plan and one day we'll be able to share the comfort we receive. You're going through a trial this morning, you're going through a suffering, you're going through a situation. Claim God's promise, have hope in God. He promises that he'll comfort and get us through our trials. Philippians 4 says, the first 6 through 7, God promises peace when we pray. You need peace in your life? You have a lot of anxiety and unrest and nervousness and fear? Take a deep breath and begin to talk to the Lord. And communicate with Him and develop a life of prayer. And claim this promise that through prayer you'll have peace. God promised that He will finish the work He started in us. God does nothing in half measure. He started a work in your life, and he will be sure to complete it. Philippians 1.6. Jesus Christ promised abundant life to those who follow him. John 10.10. 10. Following Jesus brings us more spiritual fulfillment than we could have anticipated. We leave boring behind, and we have purpose in our life. You say, I feel like I have no purpose. I feel like I'm just wandering around. Then either you're not saved, your eyes are off Christ. Claim Christ's promise and find hope that he'll give you an abundant life. Jesus promised that he'll return for us. John 14, verse 2 through 3. And from then on, we'll always, we'll always be with him for all of eternity. And I have hope 
That yes, this might change and this person might uh, lead the world or lead the country and these things might happen and these things might be on the horizon. And rather than just get all worried about those things and focus on them, I have a hope because I know, ready? I know when I look at the back of my Bible, I know how the story ends. Spoiler alert, I know what happens. I know the end of the movie. I know the end of the script. I know the end of the play. I know what's going to happen. And so in times of worry and unrest... I have a hope in Jesus Christ. I have an assurance in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, five simple verses. But I would challenge all of us this morning, value and understand the miracle and awesomeness of your salvation. And if you've not made that decision, make it today. I would understand if you received an inheritance, an incorruptible inheritance, so strive to live a life that reflects Christ's identity. We are a stranger. We are a pilgrim to this world. Don't be like the world. Don't be pressured to be like the world. Stand out. What this world needs is not another person walking in the ways of the world. It needs someone who offers hope and peace and direction, and that can only be a believer who has Jesus Christ in their heart. Reflect the identity of your Father in your day-to-day -day life. And then as a believer, because Jesus Christ lives, you have hope. Keep the faith this morning. Walk with Christ daily and have that confident expectation that God will continue to work in your life.